Hey y'all, Coach in the Fight here, you guys. Stacy with me. Shalom. And today is the 10th day of the first lunar month. And in today's class, we're going to be talking about the choosing of the lamb. Okay. Talking about that Passover lamb and which one will you choose. Right. And it's no accident that you guys watching this video are here for this lesson. For a lot of you, it's going to have a surprise in it towards the end. And you'll be sure that our Father sent you here to hear this message that we have to present. Okay. I like surprises. And once again, we're going to be going line by line, precept by precept, here a little and there a little. Now we kind of understand what that means, right? Yeah. Mm -hmm. I think in yesterday's class, we hit about, what, 10 books? And countless verses as we brought out the significance of Passover. Right. Well, we're not going to hit that many books today or that many verses, but we're going to be doing something similar as we jump throughout the scripture looking at the 10th day of the 10th month. Okay. Now, of course, the first verse that we'll want to look at is over here in the book of Exodus in chapter 12. Okay. This is when the children of Israel was about to leave Egypt and they started getting these commands from the father related to Passover. You see there in verse 2 where he's talking about the beginning of months or the beginning of the year. Mm -hmm. And then if you would read verse 3. Speak ye unto all the congregation of Israel saying in the 10th day of this month they shall take to them every man a lamb according to the house of their fathers, a lamb for an house. So this is what the 10th day is all about. It's about the choosing of the lamb. Mm -hmm. Now, for many people, this won't actually include a fleshly lamb. Right. We, we recognize the Messiah who was the word made flesh as the lamb. Mm -hmm. So instead of going out into the pastor and grabbing one of these lambs like we'll do later on today, Many people will decide which scripture they'll actually read for the Feast of Unleavened Bread. Yeah. Mm -hmm. A lot of people will choose to read the first five books of the Bible, but some will go on to read the New Testament of the Bible, and some will even choose the Third Testament of the Bible, which we're going to talk about a little bit later. Okay. But I would also suggest the Shepherd of Hermas, which if you wanted to, you could read in about four hours. But we just need to remember that that's what it's all about is the choosing of the scripture or the choosing of the lamb that we will have for the Feast of Unleavened Bread. So are you saying that today is the day where they should um, make a plan as to what um, word they will be reading? Is that what you're saying? Yes. Matter of fact, I didn't plan to do so. But this touching on my testimony a little bit. Back in the year 2018, when I was being purified by pain, so to speak, I found myself begging the Father for some instruction and understanding of what was actually going on with me. And it was exactly on the 10th day of the month in the year 2018 that he led me to the Third Testament of the Bible. Right. Mm-hmm. I know you guys have heard this story before, so I'll spare you with all the details. But what I ended up doing after I discovered the Third Testament of the Bible was I found the audio book over on YouTube and I downloaded it using this Wondershare program and put it on my phone. And from the 10th day of the month until the first day of Unleavened Bread, I walked around with headphones on. Just listening and just listening to it. I was still working and and doing stuff, so I wasn't able to pay much attention to it at all. But every once in a while, the father would bring something to my ears for me to hear that really caught my attention. And it was during those four days that I decided that for the whole week of unleavened bread, I was going to listen to and read nothing other than the third testament of the Bible, and that's what I did. Right, I remember that. But anyway, let's go on with this class. Now, the next verses that we want to look at is up in the book of Joshua, chapter 4. This is after Moses and Aaron had passed away, and Joshua has taken the reins or the leadership over the children of Israel, and he is leading them across the river Jordan to the promised land. If you would, read verse 18. 
And it came to pass when the priests that bear the ark of the covenant of the Lord were come up out of the midst of Jordan, and the soles of the priest's feet were lifted up unto the dry land, that the waters of Jordan returned unto their place, and flowed over all his banks as they did before. Now here is the second time that our father has parted some waters for the children of Israel to cross. Yes. Just like the Red Sea, the River Jordan was halted and stopped, allowing them to walk across on dry land. Mm -hmm. But when we look at verse 19, we see when this all occurred. And the people came up out of Jordan on the tenth day of the first month and encamped in Gilgal in the east border of Jericho. So this is important. They entered the promised land, which was across the river Jordan, on the tenth day of the first month. Mm -hmm. And we understand all of this to be living parables from where we sit now. So... This should be adding significance to the 10th day of the first month. Maybe not the year exactly, but it's definitely pointing to that particular day of the first month. Right. But since I bring up the year, let's jump over and let me show you something else interesting. This is coming from the book of Jubilees in chapter 50. If you would, read verse 4. Wherefore, I have ordained for thee the year weeks and the years and the jubilees. There are 49 jubilees from the days of Adam until this day, and one week and two years. And there are yet 40 years to come for learning the commandments of the Lord until they pass over into the land of Canaan, crossing the Jordan to the west. So what this is telling us is that it was a jubilee year when they crossed the river Jordan. Hmm. It's telling us that it was actually the 50th Jubilee from the days of Adam. And if we come in using the scripture alone from books like Genesis chapter 5 and chapter 11, as well as the book of Exodus, we can see exactly what year this took place. Now over here in the book of Jubilees, it says 2450 a.m. And if you do the math on this, what this ends up being is... 50 times 49 years, but that a.m. is Anu Monday, which is talking about the days from Adam. But using the information from Scripture, we can actually convert this over to a time that we understand, and this falls in 1455 B.C. So if we wanted to, and we will in another class, we could use this information on the Jubilee year when they crossed the River Jordan to calculate the next Jubilee. But we'll save that for another class as well. What I really just want to bring out here is how the crossing of the River Jordan was during the Jubilee year and that will become a little more important as we go a little further along in this video. Now just for grins and giggles there's one other verse that I wanted to bring out on the 10th day of the first month, and that's coming from Ezekiel chapter 40. If you would, read verse 1. In the five and twentieth year of our captivity, in the beginning of the year, in the tenth day of the month, in the fourteenth year after that the city was smitten, in the self same day the hand of the Lord was upon me and brought me thither. Now, the really interesting thing that I'm finding out about the book of Ezekiel is that many of the prophecies that have a time stamp that Ezekiel received are prophecies for futuristic events. For instance, what he's going to be talking about in this chapter happened back there during his time, but it's also going to happen sometime in our future. Mm -hmm. And if you would, look at verse 3. And he brought me thither, and behold, there was a man whose appearance was like the appearance of brass, with a line of flax in his hand, and a measuring reed, and he stood in the gate. Now, I don't know if this is related at all, but when I read this, preparing for this class, the book of Revelation, chapter 11, verse 1, came to mind. If you would, read that. And there was given me a reed like unto a rod. And the angel stood, saying, Rise and measure the temple of God, and the altar, 
and them that worship therein. See how it's talking about how he has a meat for the use of measurement? Mm -hmm. Well, that's the same thing that Ezekiel was talking about a measuring read. Matter of fact, if you go on in this chapter 40, it's all about measuring the temple and the court. Right. So, I don't know if that's related at all, but it's definitely interesting. And it gives us something to think about. So, let's just go on to Matthew chapter 21. If you would, read verse 8. Verse 8. And a very great multitude spread their garments in the way. Others cut down branches from the trees and straw them in the way. You know what's about to happen next? Uh, this is when the Messiah is about to come into the city. Yeah, this is that triumphal entry. Mm -hmm. If you would, read verse 9. And the multitudes that went before and that followed cried, saying, Hosanna to the son of David. Blessed is he that cometh in the name of the Lord. Hosanna in the highest. So all of this occurred on the 10th day of the first month. And here it is that they're actually choosing their lamb. Okay. Mm -hmm. That's what the 10th day of the first month is all about. Is choosing is the choice. So let's go on. 10. And when he was come into Jerusalem, all the city was moved, saying, Who is this? And the multitude said, This is Jesus, the prophet of Nazareth of Galilee. So here it is that... They are recognizing him as the Messiah. And I know this is a little bit off topic, but look what was the first thing he did when he came into the city. And Jesus went into the temple of God and cast out all them that sold and bought in the temple and overthrew the tables of the money changers and the seats of them that sold doves and said unto them, It is written, My house shall be called the house of prayer. But ye have made it a den of thieves. Now, like we said, much of what we read in the scripture is living parables. So I believe we could also look forward to this type of event happening on the 10th day of the 10th month. Maybe not in the year 2021. Matter of fact, let's go over and glance at one scripture that gives us a hint on when this type of event could actually take place. This particular line will come from the epistle of the apostles. And when we jump down to verse 17, I believe we get a hint on when these money changers will be tossed in the future. 17 says, we said unto him, Lord, after how many days shall this come to pass? He said unto us, when the hundredth part and the twentieth part is fulfilled between the Pentecost and the Feast of Unleavened Bread. So here he's talking about the 120th Jubilee. They're asking him, when is he going to return to toss up this temple again? And he's telling them after the 120th Jubilee. I think the important thing to understand here is how he's talking about the 120th Jubilee and remembering what we read over in the book of Jubilees how that event happened in the 50th Jubilee. And if we do the math on this, we see that the 120th Jubilee cycle started sometime around 1975 and will end sometime around the year 2024. That is the 49 years. Yeah, the Jubilee year is actually the first year of the Jubilee cycle. So we add another 49 years from the beginning of the 120th Jubilee cycle and we end up somewhere around the year 2024. Mm -hmm. But we talk about that in other videos, so let's go on. Let's glance back over at Matthew and verse 9 right quick before we go on. And a great multitude spread their garments in the way. Others cut down branches from the trees and strawed them in the way. With that information, we want to jump over to the Third Testament of the Bible. This is actually the third part of the trilogy. This is the scripture that's given during this time as we prepare to go into the Millennial Age or the Kingdom Age. As it turns out, every time humanity goes into another age, our Father gives us another document. And without going into all of the details on this, maybe I'll have to do another class on it. 
but Adam and Eve were born sometime during the time of Gemini or, and Taurus. And we know that during the time of Moses was when humanity was about to enter the age of Aries. And that's the time when we got the Old Testament. And then when humanity was about to go into the age of Pisces, that was the time when the Messiah came to earth in human form and we got the New Testament. So each time humanity goes through one of these changes, these new ages, our Father gives us a new document for our learning and edification. Well, now that we're entering the age of Aquarius, he has once again given us a new document for our instruction, and it is the Third Testament of the Bible. So, just as a quick rundown, in Moses' time, we got the Old Testament, which taught us the covenant and how to live within the laws of the universe, or the laws of nature. And during the Messiah's time, we got the New Testament, which taught us how to love one another. That's why the Messiah said there was two great rules to love the Father and to love each other. That was during the time when we learned to love. And in the third era is when we're learning light or spiritualism or how to take advantage of our spiritual nature. And that's what the third testament is all about. But there's one section in particular that I want to jump in here to talk about, and that is chapter 11, which has a section on the triumphal entry of the Messiah. If you would, Stacy, read verse 90. Triumphantly, the multitudes received me upon my entry into the city of Jerusalem. From the towns and villages, the people came in crowds men, women, and children, to see the master's entry to the city. They were those who had experienced the prodigy and proof of the power of the Son of God. The blind who now saw, the multitude who could now sing the Hosanna, and the bedridden who had left their beds to come, hurrying to see the master in the Passover feast. See, we have to remember that this triumphal entry happened towards the end of his life. Mm -hmm. In fact, it was within four days or five days of the day he was actually killed. Right. So they had already witnessed all of these miracles that he had done for the past three and a half years. Mm -hmm. And here was the people who recognized him as the Messiah. Right. And they were there to welcome him and to escort him into the city. Right. Mm hmm. That three and a half years is significant when you think about Revelation chapter 12. But anyway, let's go on to verse 91. I knew that the triumph was momentary. I had already warned my disciples of what must later happen. It was only the beginning of my struggle. And now, at much distance from those events, I tell you that the light of my truth continues in the struggle between the darkness of ignorance, sin, and falsehood. For which we reason, I must add, that my absolute triumph has not yet arrived. So what he's talking about here is how that triumphal event was only momentary. It was short-lived. I mean, they were there casting their garments on the ground on his path. But like we said, four days later, they killed him. Right. Mm -hmm. But what he's talking about here is how even till this day, his truth continues in the struggle against the darkness of ignorance, sin and falsehood. That's actually still going on today. Yeah. Mm -hmm. But anyway, let's go on to verse 92. How could you believe that the entrance of Jerusalem met the triumph of my cause when few were those who had been converted? And many those who did not know who I was. Yeah, many people didn't even recognize him as the Messiah. Right. Those who he had healed, those who come to love him at that point recognized him. But the Pharisees and the Sadducees and the other religious leaders of the day didn't even see him as the Christ at all. Mm -hmm. Even though he had done many uh, miraculous works, they still... Um, believe him to just be an ordinary man maybe a prophet but they definitely did not believe him to be uh 
the king of kings, you know, to, to be the master. They even saw him as a threat. And they went on to try to silence him. Matter of fact, I shouldn't say try. They actually killed him because they saw him as a threat. Mm -hmm. Instead of seeing him as the Messiah and somebody whose message say they should embrace with all their heart, they saw him as a false prophet or a false teacher that was spreading heresies and needed to be damned. Right. All right, go on to verse 93. And even if that humanity had been converted to my word, were there not yet many generations to come? So that was 2,000 years ago. So if we wanted to, we could try to figure out how many generations has come since that time. Right. Mm -hmm. That moment of jubilation, that fleeting, triumphal entry was only a reflection of that triumph of light, good, truth, love, and justice that will come one day and to which you are all invited. Now, this right here reminds me of the... Passover supper, that what they call the Last Supper, when he told them that he wouldn't partake in the blood of the grape mm -hmm. until the millennial age. If you would, read verse 29. But I say unto you, I will not drink his for of this fruit of the vine until that day when I drink it new with you in my Father's kingdom. That's what he's talking about over in verse 94 when he he says, and justice that will come one day to which you are all invited. But the main thing that I want to point out here is how he seems to be hinting on the jubilee. See how he used the words jubilation there? Mm -hmm. He's going to use this word a few times here, and I think he's trying to tell us something. But let's look at verse 95. Know that if even one of my children is still found outside New Jerusalem, there will be no celebration, for God will not be able to speak of triumph. He cannot celebrate if his power has not been able to save even the last of his children. So what this is talking about is that in his second coming, it's not going to be like the first coming where only a few people recognized him, but everybody's going to recognize him. Right. Now, this really gets interesting when we look down in verse 96. You are they who in the second time sang the Hosanna when Jesus entered Jerusalem. Now that I manifest to you in spirit, you do not throw your cloaks before me. It is your hearts that you offer for the dwelling place of the Lord. So this is talking about the people who is actually embracing this third testament of the Bible. That's who he's talking about here. When he says, you are those who in the second time sang the Hosanna, you are the people, the people listening to this video, the people reading the third testament, the people embracing the third testament, and for all of the knowledge, wisdom, and understanding that it has, are the same people who in the second era, 2,000 years ago, were there welcoming the Messiah into Jerusalem. Mm. We are the ones who was recognizing him then, and that's why we are the ones who are recognizing the Third Testament now, is what it's talking about here. Okay. And just like there are those who now try to discredit the Third Testament of the Bible, well, they were the same people who in the Second Era said that Jesus wasn't the Christ. Tried to discredit him. Absolutely right. If you will, go ahead. Today, your Hosanna is not shouted from your throats. This Hosanna springs from your spirit as a hymn of humility, love, and recognition of the Father, as a hymn of faith in this manifestation that in the third era, your Lord has come to offer you. So, like we said at the beginning of this video, it's no accident that you're actually watching this video, especially if this is your first time hearing about the Third Testament of the Bible. Mm -hmm. And we offer you links to this book in the description of this video, both an audio book that you can listen to and a PDF version that you can download for free. But there are actually copies of it that you can order online, including this soft cover copy that you can order from Amazon or Walmart or Barnes & Noble or somewhere like that. And if you want a hardcover copy of the book, 
you can actually get it from a website called getthirdtestament.com. Right. Mm -hmm. And we'll give you a link to that website below as well. This is actually a very beautiful book. Yeah. And I will suggest you get the hardcover copy because we know how easy it is to damage the softcover copies. Yeah. Mm -hmm. But anyway, let's go on. Then, like now, you follow me in my interest to Jerusalem. The great multitude surrounded me, captivated by my words of love. Men and women, the elderly and children, the city trembled with their voices of jubilee. So, what this is saying is, whereas there's a day when every eye is going to recognize that the Messiah has returned, that's going to be sometime after the day of his wrath and only after humanity has been humiliated to the point where we can recognize him. We who are recognize him now are the ones that's following him into that new Jerusalem. Mm -hmm. Yeah. But notice how once again he's referring to the Jubilee. I don't think that's any small significance, but let's go on. The very priests and Pharisees, fearing that the people might rebel, said to me, Master, if you teach peace, why do you permit your disciples to raise a scandal in this manner? And this is the same thing that's going on today. And while there are so many preachers and teachers out there that try to shut down the Third Testament of the Bible, mm. they don't want people to hear it. Mm. The same way they didn't want people to hear the Messiah's words all the many years ago, they are still yet once again shutting it down, and they're actually doing a pretty good job of it. Yeah. There's mm -hmm. very few, just like it was then, there's actually very few that's actually recognizing our Father's Word. Yeah, it is a um, great disservice that the people are doing, the leaders are doing to their congregation or even to the people to tell them that this Third Testament is not an inspired writing of the Father. It is definitely their loss. And they don't have to say so. They don't have to come out and say that out loud. I mean, they know about the Third Testament of the Bible. Many of these guys on YouTube, just like in our local churches, know about it because I told them personally. But are they teaching about it on their channel? Are they telling anybody about it? No. Well, that's why nobody really knows about it. That's what they're doing to hide it is that they're just not bringing it to your attention, not even making you aware of it. Yeah, one of the things that I think is very interesting is that you very seldom hear people uh, uh, talk about it, even in a bad sense. You know, it's like they're just, I guess, covering it so that you won't have no knowledge of the book. For yourself to read to see if it's true or if it's not. Don't want you to even know about it, good, bad, or indifferent. Right. And I believe the reason behind that is they know that once people actually start to read it for themselves and bounce it off of everything they know about Scripture, that they're going to find out that is the truth. And many of these people are going are going to go on to read the entire book. Yeah. Once you read it for yourselves, there is no way. I'm going to say 100% possibility that you can say that it doesn't line up with the um, 66 books as well as the lost or forgotten books. You're not going to find any discrepancies in it. No. No contradictions in it. Well, that's the thing about the Word of God, and that's how you know Scripture from any other document, is because it lines up perfectly with everything you've ever read. All of Scripture is like a huge puzzle. Where each religion is given certain pieces in the way of books. This religion, Christianity, has this 66 books. The, uh, the Mormons have a different set of books. And there are other religions that have other books. Well, when you put all of those books together in one place, they build or create one solid picture just like a huge jigsaw puzzle. Yeah, and the Third Testament should rightfully um, be included with those books. Definitely. It is the third part of the trilogy. It is the Third Testament. And it's just as important as the Old Testament and the New Testament. But anyway, let's go on. And I answered them. I tell you that 
If these should hold their peace, the stones would cry out. For these are moments of jubilee, the culmination and the glorification of the Messiah among those hungry and thirsty for justice, of those spirits that for a long time have waited the coming of the Lord in fulfillment of the prophecies. And once again, it is the humble. Mm -hmm. It is those that are sick. It is those that are poor. It is those that are humiliated that are actually hearing the third testament of the Bible. Mm -hmm. And just like before, those that are haughty, those that are arrogant, those that are prideful and materialistic and wealthy are doing everything they can to deny it and keep it out of the eyes and hearts of humanity. Well, uh, you know, if you when you dive into this book, you will see why. They are doing it. Yeah, because it threatens their materialism. Right. You know, their big churches, you know, some of these guys have <laughs> congregations that are buying them million dollar jets. They don't want to put that in jeopardy at all. Mm -mm. And no. but that's exactly what's going to happen when those congregations learn how detrimental materialism is to their spirituality. Right. They actually work against each other, we learn in this book. Yeah. You can't be a spiritual individual and a materialistic individual just like you can't serve God and mammon. Right. You have mm -hmm. to have one or the other. And because they don't want to put their big houses in jeopardy, their big wealth in jeopardy, they're actually making sure that their congregations don't hear about this book. But anyway, notice how he used the word jubilee again there. Mm-hmm. Even in this same section, we've heard this word used several times. Right. Mm -hmm. Like I said, I believe he's trying to tell us something, but let's go on. Verse 98. In that jubilee and gladness, my people also celebrated their liberation from Egypt, that commemoration of the Passover. I wish to make unforgettable by my people, yet truly I tell you that I did not comply with the simple tradition of the sacrifice of a lamb. No. I offered myself in Jesus, the sacrificial lamb, as the role through whom all my children must be redeemed. So, in the first era, in the time of Moses, we got a materialistic lamb. Yes. A little fuzzy animal walking around on four hooves. Mm -hmm. In the second era, our lamb was the Messiah. Yes. And the Christ. And in the third era, our lamb is the third testament of the Bible. Yes. And mm -hmm. so that's why we're bringing this out so heavily, giving you guys the opportunity to choose this as your lamb going into the Feast of Unleavened Bread. Right. Mm -hmm. But once again, notice that he says Jubilee in that one. That was like four or five times he's talking about the Jubilee there. Mm -hmm. So maybe we'll go in and we'll study more on the Jubilee and its significance to the second coming of the Messiah. Yeah. Mm -hmm. We'll cover that in another video. But I believe we've covered everything we wanted to cover in this video. So, Stacey, you got anything else? I'm just thinking about how it was such a benefit that the Father has given us this opportunity to choose um, the Lamb as the Word. Because, you know, a lot of people um, in this day and time would not be able to um, have a Lamb, the animal, a Lamb. And so now everybody who wants to choose this lamb, which is the word, has definitely has the opportunity to do so. So as you get ready to choose, we're not telling you what to do. You have many, many choices. Like you said, you can read from the Old Testament. You can read from the New Testament. You can read from the Apocryphal books, which include the Shepherd of Hermas. But you should consider the Third Testament in one of your choices, if not mixed in. You could actually have a mix of all of the choices. Mm -hmm. The first book I ever read of the scripture was the book of Proverbs. Okay. Mm -hmm. But anyway, so if there's nothing else, we'll go ahead and close this out. So if you guys would, leave us a comment, hit the like button, and we will see you in the next class. Make sure you have that subscription button pushed and that bell notification button pushed, and shalom.